Hey, did you hear the Sens owner doesn't want Leafs fans going to Ottawa home games? Yeah, that whole idea is a little screwy. You think the Leafs should do something like that? Are you kidding me? I wouldn't want Sens fans to miss a game like that. Oh my goodness, finally! Go, Canadian fans! Country! Yeah. Deal with it. Deal with that! Owen Rubowski. GTFO. <laughs> I got it from a bar. <laughs> okay, how about this? Sens fans can be seat fillers when all the suits in the platinum section are out getting sushi. And they're sitting nice and close so you can see the disappointment in their eyes when the Leafs score. You're a monster. The Leafs win 3 to nothing over the Ottawa Senators. And this was just a matchup of two bunged up teams. You know, the Leafs missing big chunks of their lineup. Matt Fratton was a key piece. Joffrey Lupul still out. Gunnarsson, Gardner, Reimer who was having a great season. The Sens missing their number one center in Jason Spezza. The reigning Norris Trophy winner in Eric Carlson. And I forgot, Milan Mahalik who's actually a pretty good player for them. And I don't know if you saw it, but the Leafs actually brought in the 1963 Stanley Cup winning team in case any more Leafs get hurt. Mix up the line, see if Dave Keon can get Grabowski going, something like that. And part of me is against ceremonies like that because really, you're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the 1963 Stanley Cup winning team. When 67 was the last time the team made it to the final, let alone win the cup. But you see the look on all the players' face and you're like, no. You can tell they really enjoyed it and if you're not a Leafs fan you might not understand, but it means so much more that Dave Keon was there. There was a lot of bitterness between Keon and the organization and I think that was only the second time he was back at the ACC for a ceremony like that. And someone with not quite as many career goals as Dave Keon scored the opening goal, Fraser McLaren. That sniper! Mark Fraser puts it on, Fraser McLaren tips it with like his leg I think and it goes in, one nothing. Leave it to Fraser McLaren to score a goal without his stick. That was McLaren's first goal since November 29th, 2009 in a 4-2 Sharks win over the Canucks. Who did he score on? Roberto Luongo. So he beats a guy like Roberto Luongo. He beats Craig Anderson, who's the hottest goalie in the NHL right now. Try this guy with Kessel. Put him with Grabo. Get them going. Just get, don't, don't do that. But I gotta admit... This fourth line's turning me a little bit. And I'm getting a lot of responses on Twitter because I kind of trashed the fourth line earlier this season going, See, told you they were good! Well, the main reason I didn't like him is because they were playing like four minutes or less per game, only contributing fights and just getting caught in their own zone and getting scored on. But now you're seeing Colt Knorr's minutes increase. He played almost 13 minutes last night and he's actually like... Playing. And then Fraser McLaren, not a sniper, but on his goal, he's doing exactly what a guy Fraser McLaren's size to do, just standing in front of the net. And that's what you got to do to get goals on Ottawa. Craig Anderson's playing out of his mind. Here's a little stat I just realized. Craig Anderson did not get scored on with a shot in this game. The one nothing goal was a deflected Mark Fraser shot off Fraser McLaren's, I think, leg. The 2 nothing goal was a Phaneuf, like slap pass off Bozak skating in. And the 3-0 goal was a John Michael Lyle shot, but it was an empty netter. So even though they're depleted from injury, against a goalie that hot, you take whatever you can get. And just as importantly, you can't give up any garbage. And not only did Ben Scrivens not allow any garbage, he didn't allow anything. <laughs> Ben Scrivens with his first career NHL shutout. And in honor of his friend, number 34, James Reimer, Scrivens stopped 34 shots. Besties! And that wasn't an easy game. The first period was a bit of a snore fest, but he stopped some really good shots in the second. And the Leafs have a pretty good record right now, and a big reason for that is Reimer was playing above average goaltending. He was really good. And with Reimer out, the pressure's on Scrivens to keep that up. Well, he just outdueled the NHL's best goaltender at the moment and got his first career shutout. Not bad. And as long as we're handing out credit, I might as well give someone credit who doesn't get any in this city, partially because of his contract, partially because of the poor performance of the team, and what he symbolizes that gets blamed on him a lot, Dion Phaneuf. Dion Phaneuf, who, with the exception of one game, has had his time on ice scaled back a little bit over the last four games. Oddly enough, four-game point streak. And you can blame Carlisle for playing him too much. I was. I think Phaneuf is much better suited playing around the 24-minute time range. But with such a young, inexperienced group of guys that are really just starting to play in the NHL, he's getting paired with Corbinian Holzer, he was paired with Mike Koska, He's got to overcompensate. And now here's a question. What does the Leafs defense look like? In no particular order, you got Phaneuf, Holzer, Koska, Lyles, Fraser, Franzen, Commissarek with Scratch, Gunnarsson's hurt, Gardner's hurt. When Gunnarsson comes back, who comes out? Holzer? I, I don't know. That was Dion's defensive partner, I thought. Then again, Gunnarsson was a pretty good pairing with Phaneuf a while back. You could take out Mark Fraser, but I don't know. I think he's played his way on the team. He's been good. And I know a lot of people rag on Koska, but... I mean, he's, he's played so much. 
Commissary's gone, basically. Sorry. Cody Franzen's minutes have been going up, and good, they should be. He's been great. He's actually part of the reason they can scale Phaneuf's minutes back a little bit, because Franzen wasn't playing much, usually under 15 minutes. And we haven't even mentioned Gardner, who apparently is cleared to play and just hasn't been called up because they don't think he should be yet. The Leafs don't have the best defensive core in the league, but it looks like they don't have the worst either, and this seems like a pretty good position to be in. And it doesn't look like it on paper, but the Leafs seem to have dare I say, depth. And you can laugh at that, but for a young, inexperienced team with so many guys out of the lineup from injury playing this well, what do you call that? And now I'm very interested to see how the Leafs are going to do against Florida on Monday. It's cold outside right now, it sucks, and you get to travel to sunny Florida. And ah, uh, The Leafs have won five of six. Maybe some players go, ah, I'm finally playing in the NHL. Life is good. Meanwhile, you got a Panthers team that's desperate for a win because all they've done is lose in overtime again. And their most recent loss to Tampa, a 6-5 loss in overtime, they were winning 5-3 in the third. They need this win. And if the Leafs have any recollection of how the standings looked in February of last season and then in April of last season, they need to win too. Thanks for watching the Leafs Nation postgame blog in the underbar. Also Marley's postgame blog, they won too. And I'll see you next time.